Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year active event, kindly supported by Systemic, and which is entitled The European Green Deal Delivering Ambitions Through a System Change Compass. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the Energy and Environment Editor of Your Active, and I will have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. A quick word of introduction, uh, if I may, before I present the panelists. I think we're all aware uh, today, more than ever before, about the need to accelerate the transition to zero carbon economy. And for the first time since the European Union was founded, environmental issues are now at the very top of the political agenda. The European Green Deal is indeed the number one political priority of the European Commission led by Ursula von der Leyen. And the overarching objective is clear, reducing emissions to net zero by 2050. The question now, of course, is uh, how do we get there? What kind of change is necessary to meet the objectives of the European Green Deal? To discuss this topic today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Sandrine dixon de Cleve, co-president of the Club of Rome, Yanez Potocnik, uh, former European Commissioner and now partner at Systemic, Kurt Vandenberger, European Green Deal advisor to the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, Stephen O'Driscoll from the European Investment Bank, Ludovic Wout from uh, the European Trade Union Confederation, and Adelaide Charlier, one of the co-founders of the Youth for Climate movement. Thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today. To kick off uh, the debate, we will first hear some quick uh, introductions by each of the panelists, and then we'll move on to a Q&A uh, debate uh, that I will moderate. This event is also being live streamed on YouTube, and we invite the audience to participate as well. So don't be shy, you can put your questions directly to the panelists by using the Q&A uh, function. That's for those who have registered for the event and are following us on the Zoom platform. Um, I think that's all uh, for me when it comes to the introduction. So let me pass on the floor immediately now to Sandrine dixon de Cleve from the Club of Rome, who will introduce a report which is being published today about a system change compass to deliver on the European Green Deal. Sandrine, tell us more about that. Thank you so much, Frédéric, and it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you to your active and to all the panelists for joining myself and Janusz on what is the launch of our new report. Uh, the context here is pretty simple. I mean, from a Club of Rome perspective and as president of the Club of Rome, we've been stressing the need to address humanity's relationship with the planetary boundaries for the last 50 years. And we've been indicating that it's absolutely fundamental that we need to get out of a growth at all costs paradigm. And this conversation is something that both myself and Janis, also as a member of the Club of Rome, felt was absolutely essential to bring into ensuring that we could implement the European Green Deal. Because the fact is, the system change compass is based on we are in now a super year. We are in a super year where we need to drive action as soon as possible to meet the decade of change that will be necessary to get our climate objectives. And to do that, we need to put in place a joined up approach, what we call a systems approach. We need to be optimized. The European Green Deal is Europe's North Star. It is Europe's grand Marshall plan. And it has been putting in place the policy recommendations that are necessary in order to ensure that we can meet not only our climate net neutrality goals, but also now preserve the lives and livelihoods of people that are being hit by this big convergence of tipping points, the health pandemic with climate change and biodiversity. So what we're trying to do now in this complexity is unpack it with a compass, a guidance, a guidance which goes very much to what Ursula von der Leyen herself as president of the European Commission said in her State of the Union address, which is the European Green Deal is our blueprint to make the transformation. And in addition, we know that we have to design ourselves out of the current health pandemic economic issues that we are seeing. So this is really the moment for Europe to shine. And what the Club of Rome and Systemic have done together is put in place a compass which we hope will guide the European Green Deal in its implementation. 
will give the right direction through 10 key principles, which Yanis will go into, and ensuring that we address major ecosystems or economic activities, not individually, but linked up so that we can optimize the overarching impact in getting us to our climate neutrality goals, meeting our environmental objectives at the same time of creating jobs and a different type of growth in Europe. So this is a decade of action. And we know that now China has also put in place its new climate neutrality goals for 2060. We know that the US is far behind us. And we know that many countries are looking to Europe to show that leadership that's absolutely essential at this time. This is truly the opportunity to make sure that we do not allow what's happening right now in the European Parliament and by the member states to block linked up thinking. We are seeing that the common agriculture policy is being put front and center rather than biodiversity and farm to fork policy working in a systems way as was being proposed by the European Commission. And we are seeing that right now in the European Parliament, the budget, which is trying to ensure that we have the foundation for a European Green Deal through conditionality principles is also being watered down. So together, Club of Rome, Systemic, and other actors, we must ensure that the European Green Deal moves forward fast in this decade of action and starts to adopt a very clear systems approach for implementation. I'm going to pass over to Yanis to give a bit more detail as to what exactly the Compass is proposing, and then we will have our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sandrine. Uh, passing on the floor to Yanis uh, Potocznik, uh, then uh, you are one of the co-authors of the report, so tell us what your contribution was. Yanis, you need to unmute yourself. Indeed, thank you. Uh, I have an impossible role to present to you the substance of the very comprehensive report in practically a few minutes which will follow. So the first thing which I would like to say is that the report is based on natural resource optics. The reason for that is simple. The way how we use natural resources to a large extent determines our economics on one hand, and on the other hand, through the irreasonable, irrational use of natural resources, we are causing all the consequences which we see in climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and so on. The report has two major parts. The first part, in the first part, we have identified the necessary enabling conditions, the main drivers and pressures that would need to be addressed and also redefined. So they present, they are presented uh, like a compass in a circle. None of them is coming first or last. They all have to be addressed simultaneously. And uh, we have identified actually 10, uh, 10 uh, actions, 10 areas which would deserve special attention. First, redefining prosperity. So moving from prosperity, which is currently defined on aggregate economic growth, to prosperity, which is defined by fair and social economic development. Second, redefining natural resource use. Moving from prosperity, which is based on natural resource use consumption, to prosperity, which would be decoupled from resource consumption through efficiency, sufficiency, and a shift to responsible use of natural resources. Redefining progress. Moving from growing economic activities and sectors to focusing on societal needs that have to be fulfilled without transgressing planetary boundaries. Then redefining matrix, moving from decisions which are driven only by optimizing for GDP to decisions driven by holistic matrix, including natural capital and also social indicators. Redefining competitiveness, moving from massive dependency of Europe on imported natural resources, we import majority of minerals and uh, more than half of energy, to a resilient Europe based on circular economy, low carbon products, services, and digital optimization. Redefining incentives, moving from incentives supporting the status quo to the incentives which would be aligned, uh, aligned with the Green Deal vision. Redefining consumption, moving from 
owing products as part of individual identity to experiences and using products and services as part of individual shared and collective identity. Then redefining finance, moving from subsidizing and investing in so-called old industries to supporting and facilitating economic ecosystems as they would be defined later. Redefining governance, moving from the top-down, static, slow, normative policy processes to transparent, flexible, inclusive, participatory models of governance influenced by science. Redefining leadership, finally, moving from traditional leadership roles and expectations to system leadership, which would be based on intergenerational agreement, which would build common ownership, in particular, integrating young generation for the future we want. For each of those 10 areas, we are proposing three core system level policy orientations, which would deserve, according to us, special attention. So Compass, it's accompanied in total with 30 clear policy orientations, and any policy decisions would need to be stress tested through proposed optics. Not detailed and prescriptive, but rather showing the direction to follow so that the compass could actually work. I certainly have no uh, time to explain you all, but let me use just one example for better understanding. The first one, as mentioned before, it's redefining prosperity. The proposed policy orientations there are, first, balance policy attention to take into account both income and wealth creation, which of course should remain in our focus, as also income and wealth distribution, and ensure that economic transition contributes to equality and social fairness by guaranteeing universal basic services and minimum levels of income. Second, create conditions for social acceptance of the necessary transition through enhancing reskilling and educational programs, introducing funding mechanisms to support transition and supporting lower and middle income groups to help them absorb the full cost, which is later introduced through the economic ecosystems. And finally, replace part of the income-based taxes with resource-based taxes to address resource as well as social policy targets. This is just one. In the report, you would find 10 times free policy orientation. So as mentioned, 13 total. This rounds up the first part of the report, an overarching system that consolidates the European economy in its entirety. In the second part, then we are moving to, from this more abstract but still very real policy making environment to the markets and to the human needs. System based and societal needs logic is leading us to an alternative structure which actually differs from economic areas and sectors conventionally used to structure the economy. So we have identified eight economic ecosystems. They are functioning in a safe operating space following the logic of nature and respect the planetary boundaries. Eco economic ecosystems are designed to deliver specific resource intensive, because this has then consequences on climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on, societal needs, four of them, healthy food, built environment, intermodal mobility, and consumer goods, which is computers we use, clothes we wear, and so on. And then additional four, which support fulfillment of these multiple societal needs. Nature-based solutions, energy, materials, which should be used in a circular way, and innovation, which in particular it's addressed through digitalization. Why we call them economic ecosystems? Because they are interlinked like environmental ecosystems. And because a lot of solutions providing resource-related human needs from our economic activity could be mirrored and based on experience acquired by, from nature. For each of eight economic systems, we are then providing three to five economic ecosystem level orientations. So a kind of policy orientations on a particular level of these ecosystems, approximately 30 in total again. Finally, finally we are proposing 50 plus nascent quite concrete economic development opportunities, we call them champions, for each of the economic ecosystems. A number of subsystems are prepared. I would say a non-exhaustive list of economic opportunities, 
which is consistent with previous compass orientation and alternative structure of the economy based on economic ecosystems. They could become the new lighthouse of the green, resilient, fair post-COVID economy that Europe wants to build and would constitute, according to us, the 21st century backbone of competitive European economy. I don't have, unfortunately, time to go in detail in each, maybe in the debate, we could use some examples, but to round up in summary. 10 compass orientations, setting the conditions for transition accompanied by 30 clear policy orientations, eight economic ecosystems, and three to five specific ecosystem policy orientations, and finally, 50 plus champions, non-exhaustive list of economic opportunities consistent with previous part of the report, compass orientations, alternative structure of the economy based on economic ecosystems. Not easy to explain in a few minutes, but a complex system connecting our macroeconomic policy related world on one hand, with very microeconomic, concrete economic ecosystems, development opportunities, rare, but possible and very much needed. So worth of your attention and uh, uh, more detail. So also, uh, your focus in reading, I hope. European Green Deal was a brave call and a decision to act, a promise and also a commitment, but it is no longer enough to just act. We must do so quickly, systematically and together. The report, our compass, is trying to contribute to European Green Deal implementation by providing a guidance for direction to achieve exactly that. Frederik, back to you. Thanks, Yanis Potocznik, and indeed we'll have plenty of opportunities later on in the debate uh, for you to uh, maybe develop uh, specific parts uh, of this report. Let me turn now to Kurt Vandenberger uh, for a, an initial reaction uh, to this report from uh, the perspective of the European Commission. Kurt, over to you. And you need to unmute yourself first. I have a problem with the microphone. Can you try and speak again? Unfortunately, uh, we can't hear you, Kurt. So we'll move uh, to uh, the next speaker and then uh, turn back to you, Kurt, um, when hopefully that problem is resolved. Uh, so let me turn to Stephen O'Driscoll from uh, the European Investment Bank for um, a reaction to the report that we just heard being presented uh, by Janusz Potosznik. Stephen. Thank you very much, Frederick, and uh, thanks very much indeed for inviting the EIB to be part of this uh, interesting panel discussion today. Um, I mean, my overall perspective uh, on the report is that it, it, it does chime actually very nicely with where we uh, as a bank are right now, which is which is consolidating our role as the EU climate bank. Um, for me, it's very welcome that the uh, report recognizes the, the key role that finance plays as a key facilitator and enabler of the transition. And where the report is, is really advocating strong system change, we as a bank uh, in this process uh, are changing our own DNA as well, I would say. Uh, we are fundamentally transforming the way we do business. And that's because we understand how profound these twin crises of uh, climate and biodiversity loss are. So what we did at the end of last year was we made three uh, ambitious commitments. Firstly, we committed that over 50% of all of our financing will be dedicated to climate action and environmental sustainability financing by 2025. Secondly, that we would support one trillion investment in those areas in this next critical decade. And thirdly, that we will align all of our financing activity uh, with the principles and goals of the Paris Agreement by the end of this year. So we're actually now in the final throes of preparing a roadmap for how we're going to meet these commitments. Uh, we're calling this our Climate Bank Roadmap. And this, again, with our upcoming revised environmental and sustainability framework, are really the entry points 
uh, for the systems change that this report is outlining. Um, the roadmap fully recognises the positive contribution that finance can play. The European Green Deal and the policy framework that is embedded within that gives us uh, a really a fantastic platform to work from. And with the taxonomy and the sustainable finance regulation now putting a good degree of order into what sustainable and green finance actually means, this is where we move away from business as usual. This is where we change the mindset and this is where we bring about the type of transformational change that the report is, is proposing. So we welcome this report very much. Um, president Hoyer, our president, has endorsed its finance dimension and we look very much forward to supporting the European Green Deal, the green recovery and being part of the uh, a compass change in the way we and everyone else thinks. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I'm turning to the uh, next speaker, uh, which is Ludovic Wood from the Trade Union uh, Confederation, and then uh, we'll try and uh, connect again with Kurt Vandenberger after that. Ludovic Wood, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, for the European Trade Union uh, Confederation, um, the European Green Deal uh, should clearly be our main uh, political compass. So we, as ETUC, we call for a people's recovery, uh, not going back to the past, uh, but building a socially fair, climate-friendly digital future. And uh, to be a people's recovery, it needs to uh, really reflect people's real needs. So uh, uh, the people's real need is to save and create millions of quality jobs, increase investment in uh, all sectors of the economy, including social and uh, uh, health service, leave no one behind uh, in ambitious uh, climate action uh, through uh, just transition, but also support, of course, working people it by company restructuring in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, in this context, the European uh, Trade Union Confederation supports the idea of having a system change compass uh, to implement the European Green Deal in a time of recovery. Uh, a green and social recovery has the potential to create new quality jobs while ensuring that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, and remain within the limited resource boundaries of our planet. To achieve a just transition that is uh, fair for all uh, and protect the most vulnerable, it will be essential to have strong social foundations as well as an inclusive governance where trade unions, workers and civil society are at the table. So for us, it's also important. To... Yeah. So for us, it's also uh, to conclude. Uh, for us, it's also important that all uh, the propositions that are in the uh, report uh, take into account uh, the um, uh, that uh, where uh, there are jobs created. We have to look also at the con uh, working conditions of the jobs created. So it is uh, particularly important because not all green jobs are good quality jobs, and it is important that we ensure that it is the case. Uh, it is also important to look at. Uh, the uh, when we speak about taxation about the uh, that there's no regressive distributional effect so it is important that low income uh, people uh, do not uh, take the burden uh, of uh, the uh, transformation it is important to have an inclusive governance as it was uh, mentioned and there it is important for us if we want to change the world of work that uh, employers and trade unions have a specific role and responsibility uh, to change uh, the uh, ecosystem and this can only be ensured by uh, through a just transition which is uh, our buzzword uh, as uh, trade unions uh, socially fair and just transition is needed to ensure uh, public uh, support uh, to climate policies thank you thank you Ludovic Wood uh, let me try again with Kurt Vandenberg if we can hear from Kurt, no, I'm, I'm... Can you hear me now? Does it Yes, work? we can. Okay, very good. Fantastic. So, uh, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you, Frederick. And uh, I also would like to thank the authors of uh, this report, uh, which has been welcomed very much uh, by the European Commission and President von der Leyen herself. She was uh, so privileged enough to have an advanced copy uh, of this report in preparing for her State of the Union uh, speech. And she was impressed uh, by the report, uh, not only uh, thanks to its quality, its depth and its uh, comprehensiveness, uh, but also 
because she really felt when uh, having read the report that systemic transformation of our economy and society is not only desirable, but also possible. And that it is not only an academic exercise, which is important in itself, but it's also implementable. Um, and she really wants the European Commission to be a driving force for this systemic transformation that the report is calling for, and which is also at the heart of the European Green Deal. That requires that we rethink our policies, that we rethink our ways of working, and above all, it requires that we change and are daring to change our mental frame um, in a way that we indeed redefine prosperity and uh, progress. It, it, it is in that light, for example, that um, she has uh, launched the European Green Deal, not as a green agenda, but as a new growth strategy uh, for Europe, uh, which is changing quite radically the way people look at uh, such a transformation agenda. Um, it's also in that light that we clearly are saying that the European Green Deal is much more than a climate agenda. Obviously, achieving climate neutrality by 2050 is our mission, but we will not get there by only cutting emissions. What we really need is a overhaul in the way we uh, produce and consume um, in our economy and the way we live uh, and work. Um, so this is really a socioeconomic agenda for modernization, which will be amplified and enhanced by what we're currently living through in this period of COVID pandemic. Um, it will create a lot of uncertainty, which will need direction for investment for economic opportunities. Um, and the European Green Deal, helped by this new report, will be the possible compass uh, for this. As far as the Commission is concerned, uh, this involved all our policies, um, industry, finance, transport, health, education, research and innovation, agriculture, diplomacy, taxation, trade. I could go on for a while. Um, it even involves uh, our HR and OIB colleagues, uh, because we have uh, said that the Commission will want to be climate neutral by 2030. This involves a lot of change and questioning the way we work, the way we are organized in the Commission. So what we need to do is to align everything, both in terms of narratives, policies, the initiatives we take, the way we interact with stakeholders, and also very importantly, the way services and cabinets uh, work together. We have started doing this. If you look at our recovery uh, strategy, for example, through the next generation EU, we are linking up the budget with European semester, with important uh, initiatives like the taxonomy, we're creating new structures like the Recover Task Force and the Secretary General, pulling in all the competences and resources we have across the Commission. We're doing this on the social side, uh, where we have proposed a just transition mechanism so that we leave no region behind. We are proposing initiatives and programs like SURE for uh, avoiding um, unemployment. We're working on skills. Uh, the president is working herself on a proposal for minimum wage. But even if we look at uh, initiatives like the renovation wave, which we presented recently, we pay a lot of attention there to the social dimension and the issue of energy poverty, uh, for example. And it's now up to us in the commission with the help of everyone to continue doing this in very important files like the mobility strategy that will be coming up or the overhaul of our um, climate and energy legislation next year. So uh, this is needed, this is possible, and we really uh, will look at this report and use it as a reference framework, not only for conceptualizing the way we work together for implementing the Green Deal, but also to operationalize it. Uh, so thank you again uh, for the authors of this report. Kurt Vandenberg, thank you <coughs> for those comments. Uh, and let me turn now uh, to our final uh, speaker, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Adelaide Charlier, one of the co-founders of uh, the Youth for Climate movement. Adelaide. 
Thank you very much. I will keep it very short so we can have a great discussion afterwards, which is the most exciting part. Uh, what I do want to put forward is that this is what we need right now. It's a compass, uh, especially talking about a system change. It is exactly also what the youth have been asking for. So of course, this is what we need. But please let me also remind you something. In 2030, we will already reach the 1.5 global temperature, which is the... <laughs> Paris Agreement, which is giving us very little time to act. We have now less than 10 years to reach this Paris Agreement, which for the youth means that the ambition that the EU has is still not uh, far, it's still too far from what we should be having today. So I still want to remind you the, that even with this compass, we need next to that more ambition. We need the right targets, the right budgets, sorry. We need a budget that will help us reach those targets. And um, we need the EU to be coherent. Today, as youth, we are also very scared seeing that, for example, the cap that was discussed before uh, the Green Deal was brought up is now today being voted in, on the, in the European Parliament, which is for us completely incoherent since it is not taking into account the Paris Agreement nor the Green Deal. So, of course, this is giving us a bit of stress, um, even a lot. Um, and we will keep on putting pressure for this. Adding to this, um, it is very important to make sure that the member states follow up. So my question also to all of you here on the panel is, how are we going to assure that the member states will follow this? So there is still a lot of work to be done. We are putting steps forward, but we are still very far from our targets. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adelaide. Uh, and thanks to the other speakers as well for uh, the introduction. Uh, now, let me turn to uh, each one of you with a pretty simple question, but one which is probably hard to answer uh, at the same time. Uh, we've heard the Green Deal is kind of the North Star uh, that you see in the, in the report uh, that you put together uh, today. Uh, but uh, where do we start now when it comes to the implementation? This is actually one uh, question that was uh, being asked uh, here, I see on the uh, Q&A uh, part of Zoom is, all very good, we've got this report, we've got the European Green Deal. Now, how do we start implementing? And maybe Sandrine, you can start with that. Yeah, I think it's a very good question and it's absolutely the crux and several others have also asked how do we ensure then that we bring in local authorities that we look at different parts, obviously of our governance structures. Uh, clearly what's interesting is also to look at this moment as a transformative moment. I mean, we need to tap into the consciousness of people who understand that actually the most important thing right now is lives and livelihoods, what is essential. And to do that, we can start to focus really on shifting their lives and livelihoods, creating the jobs that they actually need, which is exactly what Ludovic was talking about. We do know that if we link up, for example, the ETS and the circularity legislation, and we start to look at how we can work with industry to ensure that they become more circular, that their materials and their value chains are also less dependent on natural resources outside of Europe, that we start to localize, that we also start to create the substitution that's absolutely fundamental. Or in the area of energy, I mean, it is a no brainer now. We are at parity in terms of pricing. What we need to do is make those difficult political decisions to invest immediately in the energy system that actually is green and that will foster resilience. And I'll finish off with just a few key examples of what's working right now in terms of resilience, if I may, Frédéric. One is that the well being economies that are looking at social indicators, environmental indicators, and economic indicators together are the ones that have come much stronger out of COVID, much more resilient, and also are starting to create that resilience for future crises. It is the companies that have looked at environmental, social, and governance factors that are actually doing better through COVID than those that are actually looking at stranded assets. So I think we also need to make sure that we express the fact that systems thinking, 
bringing in the, these three core pillars of economics, environmental, social, with a governance overview actually will make us more resilient and will enable us to recover. Thanks, Sandrine. Um, turning to Yanis Potoshnik now. You were uh, at the European Commission for a number of years. Uh, so if you were now today sitting in the Berlimont, where would you start when it comes to implementing what you described in this uh, report? Listen, uh, what the report is trying to, uh, to make is to give you a kind of intellectual framework in which we would address drivers and pressures, which uh, too many times they are not. So we have intentionally presented the report in circle. So we don't want to say redefining prosperity, it's number one and leadership, it's number 10. So you basically have to simultaneously work on all the fronts. So yeah, it is not an easy thing. If you would ask me what, what is absolutely for me essential and what is creating a, a, a lot of confusion is actually all the incentives which we are today sending on the markets. So with left hand, we are sending signals protect the private interest. Don't worry, if you will destroy natural capital, you will anyway not pay it, and it will even create higher profits. With the right hand, we are protecting private, uh, public interest, and we are basically then creating regulation, putting the funds in how we would balance the situation. And all that is actually creating a lot of confusion on the markets, a lot of lobbying, and a lot of bad will, if you want. Uh, there are two things which were not addressed by the compass because uh, we, we were pretty explicit uh, by that. One is the democratic systems, conditions, social conditions also, which would definitely deserve specific attention, additional, which is not there. Because we know today how democracies do, in brackets, not work and what the problems are. The other is that clearly this is addressing European Union because we are looking through the optic of European Green Deal. But of course, European, leader, European Union has shown leadership with that, but it can't work in isolation. So it has to engage with global partners there. And thus the global partnerships which one has to create are also not part of that report and are preconditioned also. So, and finally, I think uh, we are thinking also now how to continue with the activities and we are in discussion also with the commission, where could we best help? with the next steps, how to make those things at least in relation to the business sector more concrete than they are now on the papers and to make it real. But this is uh, something which is supposed to come in a year. So we are already thinking about that very much, uh, but uh, there is no simple answer. Start with this and the rest will follow. Thanks, Janez. Uh, let me turn to Kurt uh, Vandenberger. Um, Janez Potocny talked about the, the next steps. So what are the next steps um, on the side of the European Commission? And let me add maybe one question. Um, going through the report, I saw one of the elements in there was to uh, also highlight some vulnerabilities when it comes to the European Green Deal uh, and the implementation of the Green Deal. So did that report actually uh, help you bring to your attention areas where you believe the Green Deal needs to be strengthened when it comes to the next steps that you're going to take in the coming months? Uh, well, thank you, Frederick, for the question. When will we start implementing this? I will say we have already started implementing. Uh, President van der Leyen presented the European Green Deal after 11 days in office. Uh, we immediately in early January came with uh, a Green Deal investment plan and the just transition mechanism uh, to make sure that we bring in the social dimension. Um, we have proposed an industry strategy, we have proposed farm to fork and biodiversity strategy in the midst of a very deep pandemic when many told us don't do it. Uh, this is a pandemic. This is a serious crisis. So forget about the Green Deal for a moment. Uh, let's concentrate on the economy. We have not done this. We have continued. I have proposed a historic next generation EU package uh, to overcome the pandemic, which is entirely in keeping 
with the European Green Deal uh, objectives. So rather than slowing down and waiting with the implementation, we have started implementing this. And as you may know, last month we came forward with a climate target plan uh, with an increased ambition in cutting CO2 emissions uh, by 2030. Now, I grant you um, much of this is proposals, much of this is strategies, um, but I would say to this two things. First, as we are embarking on something that is a systemic transformation, we have to first explain what the strategy is. We cannot immediately rush into all the legislative proposals that would be needed. If there is no sign up and buy in by all the actors who understand what we want to do and what their role in it is, we would have no chance in taking forward the legislative proposals. Secondly, um, of course, the Commission is uh, a proposing institution. Um, and there I very much agree with Adelaide that we need to have the European Parliament and the member states on board. They need to decide on the level of ambition that we would want them to decide uh, on this. Um, you were asking about the vulnerabilities, uh, Frederick. Um, we know that there are vulnerabilities um, in the systemic transformation. This is not some rhetoric exercise. Uh, this uh, can hurt people, companies, uh, because we're really going for deep change. And as uh, Executive Vice President Emmermans has clearly said, the Achilles heel of this whole transformation is the social dimension in this. If we are not doing this in a way that people feel and know that we leave no one behind and that there is an opportunity for a better future for everyone, this transformation will not happen. I think the benefit of this report is indeed that it provides a comprehensive, all-encompassing framework that keeps us at the European Commission sharp so that we're not forgetting about possible weaknesses, possible blind spots that we may have in our agenda. It's in that light that the report is definitely useful for us and the implementation has started. We will not delay, we continue. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I'll jump straight to Luc de Vigvoot because uh, Kurt Vandenberger mentioned social uh, policy, the social dimension of the transition it could be one of the uh, big um, uh, Achilles heel of uh, the European Green Deal. We know a lot has been tried. Uh, you can't blame the Commission for not trying. The just transition mechanism was put forward. But still, we're talking about an area where the member states still uh, have most, if not all, uh, the, the leverage there. Ludovic, maybe you can uh, say a few words about that uh, social dimension uh, of the transition and how maybe you believe this could be uh, improved uh, in the way it's being coordinated at the European level. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, it's really important uh, that uh, to focus on that uh, dimension of the, the social dimension. That is what we mean by uh, just transition at uh, union level. So um, we think that here uh, there's still a mismatch be, uh, between the climate ambition and the financial means uh, developed for the, uh, just transition. So uh, it's clear that the yeah the Commission uh, proposal was higher uh, than the Council uh, decision in July. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, the final uh, budget for the just transition fund is clearly uh, insufficient uh, if we want to transform. Uh, uh, socially, uh, with uh, social acceptance, uh, the economy. Uh, why I'm saying that? Uh, if I'm taking the example of Germany, uh, coal phase out, uh, the amount uh, on the table is 40 uh, billion uh, euro. If you look at the Just Transition Fund, it's 17.5 billion euro. So Germany, for its own phase out, put more money on the table than. Um, than the just transition fund so it will clearly uh, not uh, be enough um, and this is 
what we need in just transition in is deserve, uh, it's to ensure that the um, communities and workers affected and regions affected uh, can be transformed with investment in uh, greener jobs. Uh, but uh, this dimension with uh, so little money is impossible. If you look also, uh, and it's important to look at this uh, development of regions and sectors most affected, uh, often we say that green sectors and green investment will create jobs in the EU. This is true. But the place where the jobs will be created uh, do not coincide with the place where uh, jobs will be lost. If I look at the development of offshore wind that is taking, it is not taking place in at the same place where coal mine will close. So the question here is really that the regions that are affected needs the future, uh, needs jobs, needs greener jobs, needs also uh, cleaner air, of course. Uh, but uh, so this is what uh, it uh, concretely means uh, when we invest uh, money in uh, diversification of the economy, it has also to ensure the diversification of the regions that are affected because if, uh, in fact, uh, the transition is a hard transition for this, these regions, it will mean desertification of these regions and the support for the climate policies will be in danger. We know it's already in some regions uh, in danger, but if the support for climate policies uh, is in danger, uh, this is a problem for the long term path for decarbonation. This is a problem also, of course, uh, for democracy. I would also point the question of the working conditions in the jobs that we will uh, create. Because um, as um, as you look, uh, as you know, in the renovation, uh, the, for example, uh, we put a lot of hope in the renovation wave. It will create a lot of uh, local jobs. But when we look at the working conditions in the construction sector, they are really not good. So this is uh, uh, something that we uh, really need to assess. Also, when we will, uh, there are a lot of money that will uh, that are put with the uh, recovery strategy. That's fine, and it has to uh, fi finance climate transformation of the economy. But when we will finance uh, clean hydrogen uh, and a lot of sectors uh, um, to develop, that's good because that's climate uh, climately uh, that's good. But the question is also the uh, working conditions at the end. What will be the business model of these uh, new sectors that are supported? So that's why we have to link where we put the effort uh, to develop uh, the uh, green transformation of the economy with the concrete working conditions of the people, the concrete level, uh, living conditions of the people in the region uh, affected. So this cannot be uh, uh, overlooked. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ludovic. Let me turn maybe to uh, Adelaide Charlier uh, now for uh, this question that I put to the other panelists before. Um, where to start when it comes to implementing something as far-reaching as system change. You, you did mention the budget, the need for um, um, more ambitious uh, objectives and the need for more coherence. Is that, is that where you would start if you were closer to um, the, 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 the circles of power in, in Brussels, in the Berlimont? Of course, I think it's not an easy position at first. Um, it's a very hard task uh, to solve climate change. Um, no, but I think, of course, what I mentioned beforehand are the, the steps we have to take right now, because the, the first steps were taken, but we have to continue. And so those will be, for me, the next, the next few steps. For me, it would be no nonsense, and it is nonsense, that today we are still talking about this cap. And I'm repeating it because it is a real danger. It, it is real nonsense today. Um, so, so this would be also a step of, of how can it still be discussed today when, it had, when it's not aligned to the Green Deal we have put forward. It's just not acceptable. And of course, the right budget. This is very important because we're not only talking about even a majority of a budget going to the Green Deal. If we have a Green Deal, which means it's a systemic change, which means we, are, we need a budget, which is the whole budget. If you have a budget for fossil fuel and a budget for green energy, that means you are literally having a budget to kill your planet and a budget to save it. That does not make sense. It equals to nothing. So you, we need to be coherent also in our budget, which means having one budget 
to save the planet, to save the environment and to save humanity, which means one budget right now. And for the moment, this is not what we are seeing. We are seeing even worse uh, going back to fossil fuel. And that's very scary also. Thanks, Adelaide. Uh, let me turn to Stephen uh, O'Driscoll now from the European Investment Bank. We, we heard uh, Ludovic and Adelaide uh, talking about the budget, the need to have a bigger budget. I know the European Investment Bank is not uh, in charge of the budget, but you are in, in charge of financial uh, issues and, um, and certainly a big chunk of uh, uh, lending that is going to be directed uh, uh, into the member states. Uh, in the coming year. So what is your reflection when you hear uh, Adelaide or, or Ludovic uh, talking about lack of sufficient funding and, and contradictions uh, sometimes in uh, the funding that's available? Is there still a lot to be done there or in your view to resolve these kinds of contradictions? There, there is, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Um, yes, I mean, there is, the, there is certainly uh, a lot to do, but, uh, you know, we as the uh, long-term financing of our arm of the union, we, we have, um, you know, a significant role to play there. We are influential not only in the public sector, but in crowding in private sector investment too. So that's, that's certainly on our minds as we move forward. Um, and, you know, might I be so bold as to say that, um, you know, we as the bank, um, uh, going back to the original question of, of, of already starting on this, we started on this quite some time ago, just about the time that the EU Green Deal was, was announced. Uh, this is actually when we made our commitments. Um, but if you look back even further than that, I mean, last year, 2019, uh, just over 30% of our financing was directed towards climate action, environmental uh, sustainability. And if you go even further back than that, um, 2007 was when we um, issued... Um, our first big green bond, and we're now um, ramping that up, and we have our climate awareness bonds and our sustainability awareness bonds. So our climate bank roadmap now is um, our opportunity to actually operationalise those commitments, and this is where we will bring um, significant uh, influence to bear on, on the very significant investments that are needed um, throughout Europe. And just in terms of, of making sure that the member states are brought along with us, I mean, we, we have a... Um, uh, a whole series of experts at the bank and a very fine-tuned advisory services team that um, are intending to, to talk, you know, directly with the member states and um, understand um, how they can move towards achieving the commitments under the National Energy and Climate Plans and the NDCs and um, so that they can themselves bring about the energy, energy transition that's needed. So certainly... And um, these are some of the things that, um, that that we will be doing to try and get this whole thing started. And um, th this is where we absolutely need to be going forward. Thanks, Stephen. I um, was just told uh, by our technical people here that the report is being shared uh, as we speak um, on uh, the Zoom platform. We'll make that link available as well on uh, our own website when uh, this uh, virtual debate is over. Um, let me turn maybe to uh, Kurt Vandenberger uh, for a, a quick reaction to uh, the criticism we heard about sometimes the lack of coherence uh, when it comes to EU policies. Obviously, uh, the cap reform that is being adopted uh, this week, that is a process that was launched already years ago, something that started before the European Green Deal was implemented. Uh, but clearly the, the issue of coherence is one that the Commission has been trying to improve, at least uh, as part of the Green Deal. Actually, Franz Timmermans was uh, in charge of the so-called better regulation agenda uh, in the previous Commission. Can you maybe say a few words about ways that the Commission is trying to address this issue of, of policy coherence? Yes, you are absolutely right. Policy coherence is fundamental uh, because if economic actors and uh, citizens get different or diverging signals and incentives, uh, that creates uncertainty and it doesn't allow us and enable us to go all in the direction that we need to go. As far as internal coherence in the Commission is concerned, we work a lot on this. You refer to the better regulation. Uh, we do impact assessments uh, for all our proposals, which uh, make 
make sure that we bring in all the different uh, perspectives and that there are no contradictions. We are looking at how to better work together between services, uh, but also with agencies and with other important actors in the EU family, like uh, the EIB, which is playing a really very important role in enhancing this uh, transition. And I, I really would like to compliment the EIB for the courage it is showing in uh, its energy lending policy, for example, which was not easy to obtain. So at the EU level, we're doing what we can to uh, deliver on this uh, coherence. Obviously, when it comes to uh, the Council and the Parliament, there we still have hard work to do, um, as is shown by different uh, votes and decisions that are taking place uh, recently. Um, but that shows that um, there are different interests at play and at work, which are um, influencing those taking the decisions. Um, and if, for example, on the CAP proposal, uh, there is a risk of backsliding on the ambitions we would like to see for the CAP. That means that very important communities of uh, farmers and farming interests do not see yet the importance and the feasibility of this green reform of the CAP. It also shows that politicians are not necessarily convinced that they can win elections on such a platform of systemic transformation. So it means that we all need to do a much better job, continue in doing this job of convincing, explaining and mobilizing not only the politicians, but also those who elect the politicians. Because at the end of the day, the politicians take decisions that are um, asked for or supported by their electorate. Um, and that is where we still have a lot of work to do. And that is where I agree with those who say in the chat that at the end of the day, what really will make or break the success of this systemic transformation is not only the discussions we have in Brussels, but the extent to which we can mobilize local communities, regional authorities, uh, businesses um, and communities at a local and regional level in support of this uh, transformation. And that's where we hope the Climate Pact, uh, but also many of our financial programs at the EU level will be able to help. European Climate Pact, indeed, I think that's expected uh, by the end of this year to try and mobilize people more at a local uh, level behind uh, the objectives of the European Green Deal. Uh, let me turn, uh, or rather stay with you for, for a minute, Kurt Vandenberger, uh, about some of the budgetary aspect which was underlined by a, a number of the speakers. And, um, and let me tie this with the, uh, the, the current crisis that we're in uh, with the coronavirus. Uh, that led to something rather unprecedented uh, in the EU, which is this recovery package uh, of 750 billion euros, uh, which will be financed uh, in, in ways which are uh, quite innovative. Uh, that is something that was clearly not foreseen initially in the European Green Deal. Uh, would you say, that this is kind of a silver lining of this crisis, uh, this budget that is coming on top of what uh, you had foreseen initially. Do you think that makes the likelihood of achieving the objectives of the, of the Green Deal, does that make the likelihood uh, higher? Or, or, or would you say the, the current crisis that we're facing makes the Green Deal even harder to achieve? Well, first, um, let me be clear, we would have preferred no crisis uh, like the current one uh, caused by the pandemic. Um, but if there is such, a, because such a crisis is affecting a lot of people, a lot of livelihoods, a lot of companies. And I don't think we are aware yet of the consequences uh, this pandemic will have on our economy and our society. At the same time, um, as people are saying, never waste a crisis. Um, so it is true that in the midst of this crisis, uh, the conditions were there for the European Commission with the support of Europe's leaders to put forward this historic package of uh, financing through the, what we call, what the president has called uh, the next generation EU. 
will this help uh, to facilitate the uh, chances of the green deal we think so and we hope so because what we know have is not only the plan and the policies that are set out in the green deal and that we're rolling out step by step through initiatives like modernization wave uh, and many others we also know have the resources uh, because we often hear and rightly so that the costs of this transformation will be prohibitive um, we have shown in our impact assessment for the 2030 higher climate ambitions that actually the costs are not that high they're high but they're not that prohibitive uh, the cost yearly investment for changing our energy system and uh, adapting it to the climate mitigation targets is 350 billion euros per, per year that incidentally is the same amount as the total bill that we pay every year for importing energy from the rest of the world um, but we can now say that we have the money thanks to the next generation EU and very importantly and I'll close on this we now see that also thanks to European leadership in some part we are increasingly having international allies in this transformation we have seen very important statements and commitments by China recently also by other countries like South Africa that has committed to go to climate neutrality by 2050 like the European Union so we're no longer alone in the world so that's why President von der Leyen is saying we have the ambition, we have the plan, we have the resources, and we increasingly have the international partners. So all the stars are aligned to make sure that we deliver on this systemic transformation. But it will require the support and the participation of everyone in our economy and our society. Janusz Potosnik, I see uh, you have your hand raised. Uh, want to react maybe to what has just been said? Do you believe the stars are indeed aligned now in a way, thanks to the, uh, to the crisis, or at least that there's a good opportunity there to be seized? Yeah, I actually want to, uh, want to address two issues. The first one is, uh, I think we, first we have to be clear that <clears throat> if the European Commission would not propose the European Green Deal, which is the first time that somebody on that level actually has clearly recognized that future prosperity and economic development to a large extent depends on how we will treat natural resources and environment. And this is a great step ahead from what was uh, the, the doctrine even of the commission till that moment. So we have to acknowledge that. So what they need at this moment is truly recognition and help. So we need to create ownership between all of us that this will move ahead and uh, understand that actually transition we talk about, it's unavoidable. So it's not anymore who, uh, how, and it's just about uh, how we will, uh, how, how, how we should do it. Not, so it's actually collective action. And the final comment on that is, if you want different common agricultural policy, the only way to do it is to change the governance of the way how the, how the document, how all the policies are actually proposed and even more how they are actually voted and who decides about them. Until it is done in a way that it is voted and discussed by those who have short-term interest to, to preserve some of the status quo there, until then, you will have as you have it. So governance is the major question. Now on the second question, which Kurt was now discussing, <clears throat> it's about, if you would look to the report, it's actually giving quite convincing answer about COVID and uh, European Green Deal, how they are interrelated. We believe that already European Green Deal, it's giving most convincing answers to European competitiveness, which post COVID recovery talks about. Why? Because it's actually showing the way how by focusing on rationalization of natural resource use, which is the major cost today existing practically in all, in all uh, business sectors, that if you focus on that, where Europe is vulnerable, 
when it's importing a lot of energy, of minerals, of various natural resources, that this is the right way to go. Second, that this is giving you already the answer to the calls which are coming post COVID on reconsidering globalization effect that we are less dependent. Of course, if you go to circular economy, you are by definition less dependent because again, you lower your dependency on importance of everything, uh, on the import of everything which we are currently uh, importing. And of course, it's providing with the opportunity with more local jobs. Third, European Green Deal was already, was actually talking about that, that we are depleting natural capital and with that, that we are indebting future generations. With what we are doing in post COVID, we are actually putting additional money on the table, which again will be, go to an important extent on the shoulders of the young generation. So we need them on board. We need intergenerational agreement. And we, the minimum what we should provide them is actually the guarantee that we will not leave them with the world in which we are currently living. That's the minimum of that what is needed. Fourth, and before the last one, with the financial packages which we have on the table, we actually have the potential urgency to address also the European Green Deal related questions, which was not existing before. Now we have almost doubled budget on the table of course, which provides, as you rightly said, the opportunity, but it's quite dangerous. If we will set this money in the wrong direction, of course, uh, uh, we will not have another opportunity till 2030. That's pretty clear. And the last is that since we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever, we are first generation, which is actually living on, in socio-ecological space of planetary scope. We need to improve the governance. We need more cooperation. We need to share more sovereignty if we want to avoid the things which we are seeing today in health crisis and also in economic crisis. So this we are clearly saying in the report, these are two sides of the same coin. Please look at them in this way, because this is the way how you can actually uh, go forward and how you would show that you understand that the change is unavoidable and we have all to commit to it now and together. Thank you, Ines Potochnik. Uh, let me turn to Sandrine dixon de Cleve, who has uh, her hand raised. Sandrine. Yeah, I just wanted to build on that because looking at the chat, what many people are indicating is just this is very difficult to do. We don't have the regulation that we need. We also have the tension between the European Commission and the European level with the member states, etc. To build on what Yanis has said, what we're trying to do through the compass is to start to give that direction that's absolutely fundamental. And where can we focus? And where do we already see the interlinkages? No one said it was going to be easy, but exactly as Yanis has indicated, we have no choice. We're in the process now of having the first generation that will make less than its parents. We have the highest rates of suicide in youth and the highest joblessness in youth. And we also have the highest rates of mental depression, which has not been helped by COVID. So when people indicate, let's hold on to what we have, actually, what do we have? For the moment, our economic system is not fundamentally creating a prosperous society for people. So I fully agree with Yanis, we have no choice. We have a European Green Deal, which has started to give us the transformational options. This compass enables us to say, here's where we need to focus. Here are the 10 principles that are gonna guide us through this process. Let's focus on them. Let's ensure that we then focus on the right ecosystem activities. What are the economic activities that need to be shifted now in this decade of action? And we haven't talked about all those champions that we've identified. Through the compass, we have identified a series of industrial champions where we can bet on them also enabling us out of this. So we need radical new partnerships. We need radical collaboration. And we need to ensure that we support the European Commission in continuing to be the leader that it needs to be. But we need to put our fist down, as Adelaide said, from the very beginning. This incoherence is not necessary. We have just put forward a compass which says we can be coherent. So let's make sure we are. We have two big bills in front of us right now, the cap 
and the budget. And if we get it wrong, then we are going absolutely in the wrong direction and not following what our compass says. Sandrine, a, a quick word maybe uh, about uh, the EU's response to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, it was unprecedented, right? Uh, I mean, the, the, the amount of money that's been put on the table, 750 billion euros. Um, do you believe that makes it more likely that the European Green Deal objectives will eventually be met? I think the original idea coming from the European Commission was the first out of any other stimulus package, which was to make it green and social. But I do fear that member states are going backwards. They are not building back better. They're going back to business as usual. They are bailing out old industries and not thinking outside of the box as to how to recreate the future of work and how to think through these sectors that are being hit by COVID. Just saving the aviation sector is not going to help the aviation sector of the future, nor is it going to help mobility. So we need to actually, it's true, we need to be courageous. And in particular, our politicians need to be courageous at this time. We've seen some that have. Macron, for example, in his bailout scheme for aviation made it very clear that there needed to be green principles. And I do very much worry that the Commission has tried to put in place the right recovery package, but will it be properly implemented by the member states? That's the question. Thanks, Sandrine. Uh, let me turn to Ludovic Wout maybe uh, for a reaction on that. I mean, a, a lot will depend on, on the member states, on implementation, but also, uh, as we heard, on the buy-in uh, from local communities and trade unions in this respect uh, can play a big role. What is, uh, fr from your perspective, Ludovic Wout, uh, the, the current level of buy-in that you see uh, from the members of ETERC uh, when it comes to the European Green Deal. I mean, you say you support it, but when it comes to actual change on the ground, well, obviously we see you know, the, the usual things, that people taking to the streets uh, and so on. Um, so how, how do you help from your perspective? How can you help um, you know, bring that sort of buy-in? Yeah, a crucial question. I think the, it's clear for the ETUC that we support and our members voted our mandate uh, to support the decarbonation of the economy. And yeah, we also support the minus 55% for 2030. Uh, but then we are in a COVID-19 crisis and we see then directly the consequence also on the ground. So uh, uh, supporting the climate goals, uh, we have to look uh, at the, uh, yeah, the link of the climate goals with the social aspiration. Uh, of the people and if uh, the climate goals brings uh, destruction of jobs without uh, uh, yeah without proper social protection without uh, investment uh, in new jobs uh, and uh, so uh, our transition and not a just transition of course then it's concretely complicated uh, and so this is how we try and so we try to help and we try to push uh, here and we need to uh, we need a common responsibility. Uh, from the national government, from the employers, from the social part, uh, from the trade unions, from the European Commission also, and civil society, that uh, when we decide that it is climately good and we agree with this uh, to close down the mines, then it should, uh, it should mean also that the miners should have a future. Uh, and this is a concre uh, concrete example when we discuss uh, uh, the closing down of the mines, uh, then what are uh, the national uh, government proposing? So this is, this is something where uh, when uh, agreeing with the targets does not mean that the measures on the ground are concretely done, uh, are correctly done. And this is what we have to ensure. We have to ensure the uh, social, uh, acceptance of the climate policy and this is exactly in jobs in taxation where it's uh, begin uh, to be uh, difficult and with uh, ETUC we try uh, as much as possible to uh, to support uh, this uh, but uh, yeah uh, this is why we push for more money for just transition this is why we push for ensuring uh, diversification of the economy and concrete social protection for the workers because if 
if they turn up uh, their back uh, to climate policies, then it will be even uh, more problematic uh, for uh, for democracy because they will vote for extremist parties that will say what they want to hear. Uh, that we they, we won't close the uh, the mines. Uh, it is uh, uh, the, the the space for climate denials is existing if we do not uh, ensure the social aspiration of the people. So climate and social aspiration of the people cannot be delinked. Thanks, Ludovic. And I'll turn to Adelaide Charlier for some concluding uh, remarks, because we've uh, reached the end of the time that we had uh, reserved for that conference. Uh, Adelaide, uh, the, the CAP is a good example of, of politics in a way. Uh, politics is the art of compromise, they say. Um, and the result of that compromise is something that uh, you said was not up to your expectations. Uh, how can movements like uh, the Youth for Climate movement uh, you know, end up continuing to support the European Green Deal uh, in a way that you know, breaches or helps meets uh, the highest level of ambition? Are, are you currently disappointed by how this European Green Deal is actually happening? Uh, on the ground and how do you how do you intend to move forward in in the months uh, and years to come very good question um uh, yeah first of all just to uh maybe correct it is not what uh, we want to be implemented but what many scientists put forward to be implemented to be able to reach the paris agreement um i think that it is first of all in the movement itself we have a lot of dialogue a lot of different opinions on this question uh talking from my own point of view uh, i think the green deal like i said several times already is a first good step uh, I know uh, where we come from, and this is, we are far from where we were, but we are still very, very far from where we have to be. And so it's just very important to be clear with the citizens that we are not yet reaching the Paris Agreement. We are not there yet. Yes, we are moving forward, but we still need citizens' help. We need, we need them to keep putting pressure, but not only that, we need politicians to be able to move forward. Today, for example, uh, using the same example, with the CAP, we do not see the support of politicians with, uh, with that message. We feel like they are dropping the Paris Agreement and now they are really dropping the Green Deal. So what does it say about this Green Deal? Do, does the parliament really want to go for it? while voting for this cap, we are very scared. And going maybe just, I think citizens are ready. They are ready to change. We talked beforehand with a lot of, before the coronavirus with a lot of politicians telling us, you know, citizens, we need to give them time to change. Look at what happened with the coronavirus. They changed. If they understand the situations and they are not stupid, they can. They can understand the situation and they can change. Because this is not about, our future. This is about the present of so many people today. Changing is not only because we have to save, uh, to save some generations that will come later on. No, we are, we are having effects on people's lives today. And every day when we do not change, we are still affecting lives. So that is why it's urgent. We have to keep that into, in mind. Citizens are ready to change and they will follow if they understand why we do it. That's why communication is super important. And now the communication is we are moving forward, but we are still not aligned to the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Adelaide. And so that will serve as a conclusion to uh, today's virtual conference. Thanks uh, again to Systemic for helping us uh, to arrange this. Uh, thanks to all of uh, you who uh, followed us uh, on YouTube or on Zoom. Um, you can turn to uh, your active uh, to download the report uh, and get the full insights uh, that it brings. You just go to youractive.com and you'll be able to uh, click on the report. Thanks to all of you and have a good day. <laughs>